Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and I'm back out at Duelist Den on an absolutely glorious summer morning. We may have other days this summer that are as good as this one, but there won't be another one better, that's for sure. It's just great out here today. And what we're going to talk about today is my new-to-me English fowling piece. And this is a gun that I bought in May at the uh, Lancaster Long Rifles Muddy Run Rendezvous. And if you missed my video on that rendezvous, I'll put a link down below. But uh, my friend Rod, Rob, was uh, simplifying his life. He's getting up there in years, as we all are, and he's traveled the world and um, picked up a lot of things in his travels. And he's decided that things that he isn't using all the time, it's probably time to pare down the collection. Uh, so I was lucky enough to be able to buy this from him at the Muddy Run Rendezvous. And this is a 12 gauge fouling piece. And uh, it was particularly fortunate because right after buying this I had an accident and uh, ended up breaking the stock on my French fusil de chasse. So except for military stuff like the brown bess, this is right now my only functioning civilian smoothbore. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about smoothbores, and um, then our main purpose here, besides giving you a first look at this, is going to be to try to find a good bare ball load, and I'll talk about more, uh, talk more about that in just a few minutes. So let's go, let's go take a look at this gun. We'll show you some of the features. Well, I think most Americans are much more interested in flintlock rifles than they are in flintlock smoothbores. Uh, the flintlock rifles are very evocative of Daniel Boone and opening up Kentucky uh, all the way to the mountain men. And we became a nation of riflemen and, and I think you know we're interested in the precision capabilities of flintlock rifles. But the fact is that during the 18th century the rifle was a specialist tool. It was a niche tool. And the king of the roost were these smoothbore muskets, smoothbore fowling pieces, both for military use and for civilian use. So these are what you would have mostly found on the American frontier, and uh, particularly in the New England and New York frontiers. Now, the rifles came in with the Central European immigrants, mostly from Germany and Switzerland, uh, who had a rifle culture and brought that with them to Pennsylvania and then brought it all the way down the Great Wagon Road to Virginia and North Carolina uh, and kind of established that as rifle country. But even in those areas, for most of the 18th century, you would have found more smoothbores than you would have found rifles. So smoothbore is a very important gun. And these English-style smoothbores would have been the predominant gun that you found on the American frontier during the 18th century. Now this one is a particularly nice example. This is a contemporary gun, it's not an antique, but we don't know who built it, they, they didn't sign it. Uh, but whoever it was was a pretty good craftsman. And uh, this, this gun has very clean, simple, elegant lines, and it has just enough decoration. And I'll show you some of the moldings on it, and some of the engraving, and you can just see what a, what a beautiful, classic gun this is. So, you know, we've talked about uh, flintlock fouling pieces in general, and let me just say a few words on this one in particular. This gun is in the English style, and it's stocked in English walnut, very, very beautiful, functional. It has a 38-inch barrel. It is a true 12-gauge, uh, where the brown best musket is certainly more of an 11-gauge, but this is a true 12-gauge, so it's going to take 12-gauge components, and that means I can't use the uh, musket balls, musket cartridges, and I'm going to have to develop its own loads. It's got a uh, very nice engraved flintlock, small. I use a 7 8 inch flint. And it has some lovely carved moldings around the lock, around the entry thimble, uh, around the tang, and around the, um, the trigger guard itself. Uh, just beautiful. And it's also lightly engraved. 
so you can see a little bit of that engraving around the trigger guard and around the butt plate. So this is just a, a fine example of the gun maker's art. Like I said, it's a contemporary gun. So somebody built this fairly recently, within the last 30 years or so. Uh, but they neglected to sign it, so we don't know who it is. But I'm grateful to them for putting this together. My purpose here today, uh, besides just giving you, as I said, a first look at this gun, is to find out if I can get a good, accurate load for it. And, uh, you know, most people who shoot smoothboards today shoot them the same way they shoot rifles. They use a patched round ball, a tightly patched round ball, and that's fine. And that probably is the most accurate way to shoot them, really. Uh, and it's got a couple of advantages. One advantage, which most people don't think about, is that uh, if you're the type of person who prefers to use 3FG granulated black powder for everything, and there are a lot of people who do, then if you get a smoothbore, shooting a patched round ball is the best thing to do if you're going to use 3FG. And that's because you can use a smaller powder charge and still get an accurate load. And uh, smaller powder charges and a great big bore like this benefit 3FG. Because if you use the powder charge that would be typical for an actual smoothbore gun, uh, you would have a pretty high pressure situation with 3FG. Uh, these guns generally are made for 2FG or 1.5FG, which most people don't realize today. And in fact, in the 18th century, uh, one and one and a half FG were both cannon powder and musket powder. That's what the military used uh, in all of their guns. Two FG was considered fine powder, and that was rifle powder. In fact, when uh, when Bouquet, Colonel Bouquet, was the second in command of Forbes' expedition to take Fort Duquesne, a lot of the volunteers he got brought their own rifled guns, and because of that. He was scrambling around to buy 2FG powder that they could load in their rifles instead of the typical musket powder that the Army used. Uh, 3FG was pretty much reserved to pistols or very light rifles, 45 caliber and under. Uh, in fact, usually 45 calibers were, were shot then with 2FG. My, my personal rule for rifles is 45 caliber and under, 3FG. Uh, 50 caliber and up, 2FG. And there's a lot of technical reasons for that. Maybe one of these days I'll do a video on it. But, uh, but you'll just have to take it from me because most people won't believe me. Most people are 3FG for everything these days. But if one powder was good for everything, they'd only make one powder. So just think about that. Anyway, that's enough about that. So I'm going to load this with 2FG. And I'm not going to use patch round balls. Uh, despite the fact that that might be the most accurate way to load it. Because patch round balls are not the way that smoothbore fowlers were loaded during the 18th century. Now I'm not going to say never, because as soon as you say never, somebody will finally find a reference that says that they were. And it's hard for me to believe that nobody did it that way, especially in, in rifle shooting areas. But the fact is, I can't find a single reference for loading patch round balls in a smoothbore. And none of the researchers I know and respect have been able to find any either. So, does that mean it was never done? Uh, probably not, somebody must have done it, but it sure does mean it probably was not the common way to go. The common way to load these, which is what I'm gonna show you, is to load powder, then a bare ball, just a ball, drop it in, and then some wadding on top, and I use wool blanket pieces to wad on top. Uh, I used to use tow. Uh, tow is very period correct, so there's wool blankets or felt wads, uh, a lot of things. Wasp nest. Uh, tow is great, very light, easy to carry, easy to put down. The, the problem with tow is, particularly if you're having a dry summer, 
uh, <laughs> is it can catch the woods on fire. And I've, I've had some issues with that, so I switched over to wool blanket material, uh, which, like I say, is also period correct. So what I'm going to try to do is come up with a load for this. Uh, I'm using a 715 ball. I'm going to use 2FG Swiss powder. And I'm going to try to come up with a bare ball load that shoots well. Um, and the thing about bare ball load, and this is, this is why it's different from a patch ball load, is a bare ball load requires a fairly hefty powder charge to shoot accurately. And a lot of people think that, you know, smoothbore guns with a bare ball are no good beyond like 10 yards because that ball rattles down the barrel, wop, 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 hitting the sides, and who knows where it's going when it comes out. And that is actually false. That's an old wives' tale. What happens is when that powder ignites, it forms a cone of gas around that ball that actually centers it in the bore. The hot gas is going by it because it's not a complete seal. Act to center that ball in the bore and they can shoot surprisingly well. But it requires actually a pretty hefty powder charge to get that effect. And that's why if you shoot a, a patched ball, you can shoot like say 60 grains of 3F you know, maybe 70 grains of 3F, and you can get a pretty accurate load because you've got a really good gas seal. And uh, surprisingly, a smooth bore will, will throw things pretty well out to 100 yards. Uh, so you can use that faster burning powder and not get an overpressure situation that'll affect your accuracy. But when you're shooting a bare ball, you've got to be up around 100 grains or better of powder. Uh, to be able to get enough gases going to center that ball and throw it out efficiently at, at a decent velocity. So we're talking 100 grains, maybe 100, and, well, I'm going to start with 110, uh, maybe up to 150. I don't know. That's what I've got to see. This is, this is going to be a lot like shooting the brown bess, but just a slightly smaller board than the brown bess, so I can't use brown bess components in it. So... Uh, that's enough yakking. Let's let's go see what we can do. All right, I'm going to demonstrate how I load smooth bores. So, got my powder charge in the horn. I'm going to take a powder measure. This is 110 grains. I'm going to fill it from the horn. Pour it in the muzzle. Next I'm going to take a .715 round ball. Alright, that is a big chunk of lead. And I'm going to drop it right down the muzzle. Then I'm going to take a piece of blanket material and I'm going to send that down the muzzle as well. Hold everything in place. And now I'm loaded up. I'm going to prime at the line. So let's see how we do. Alright, this is going to be my first shot with the English Fowler. And I know you may have seen <laughs> other shots already through the magic of editing, but this is actually the first time I touch a round off in this gun. So let's see how it does. We're gonna target 25 yards away. And let's see if I can uh, put a hole in it. Ah, beautiful. Okay, this is from my friend Hugh Knight. Uh, Hugh's not a flintlock guy, and he has seen a lot of YouTube videos where there is a significant delay 
between pulling the trigger and the gun going off with the flintlock. And uh, I've explained to them that that means that there's something wrong with the way the flintlock is set up. So, Hugh, if you saw that one, that's what they're supposed to do. So, I'm going to put a few more rounds down on that target and we're going to see how it does. Okay, Hugh, that was with 2FG powder, and you see it still went off pretty much instantaneously. So that's what a well-tuned flintlock should do. All right, that's five shots. Let's go down and see how we did. That is not too bad. Definitely have a bias towards this side, but Got three in the black, two off of it, no rear sight. It's not too bad. I'm going to try a 120 grain load and see how that does, see if it improves it at all. But I got to say, I'm pretty happy with that 110 grain. All right, I marked the uh, 110 grain load holes with blue pasters, and now we'll try 120 grains and see if we can do any better. Okay, well we did pretty good with 110 grains. I'm going to bump the powder charge up now to 120 grains and see if the group tightens up at all. All right, that is five with 120, 120 grains of 2F. Let's go see how we did. Well, you can see the blue dots are where I was hitting with the 110 grain load. And with the 120 grain load, I got one, two, three, four, that's a bad one, five. So what do I like better? I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Well, I'm going to try one of the plates in Swing City. It's 35 yards away, and I'm going to be using the 110 grain 2F load. Let's see how it does. All right, whammed it. You know, a lot of people ask me why I don't bench rest these smoothbores uh, to group them, see how they do. And I just find that very difficult with a smoothbore, uh, particularly a traditional one that does not have a rear sight, because with one of these smoothbores with no rear sight, the rear sight is your eye. And you've got to put your eye in the same place all the time. Uh, you know, when you, when you cheek the gun, you've got to be right in the same position all the time so that your eye is always lined up where it's supposed to be with the sight. And I find that I'm in a different position when I shoot from the bench. So, whatever I do from the bench is totally invalid when I'm shooting a smoothbore offhand. Uh, I think you need to shoot guns the way they are going to be shot when it counts. And if that's offhand, then you need to work on your offhand when you're sighting it in. And that's what I'm doing here. Well, for my first time out in the field with uh, the 12 gauge Fowler, I've got to say I am pretty pleased. I'm not experiencing any buyer's remorse at all. I'm very happy with the way it's shot with 110 grains. I think I can do better. Of course, I could do better. So now it's time to get serious playing around with the load. I'll probably go down to 100, 105, try those. I'm going to go out to 50 yards, see what's shooting the best out there. So all that means a trip to the gun club and uh, using the real ranges and seeing what the best load is for this. And once I have that, then we're going to be able to play, and I've got some plans for this for future videos. So, I really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I enjoyed shooting it. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you did, give it a big thumbs up, right? That's what makes the algorithm work for us instead of us work for the algorithm. Um, feel free to make comments on the video. That actually helps it as well. 
and I love to read them. I read them all, good, bad, and uh, good, bad, and ugly. So feel free. And in fact, you know, I always get a few thumbs down, right? Which I find to be very unfortunate. It cuts me the quick. Uh, not many, all things considered. I have to say, I'm usually running about a 99% uh, thumbs up rate, which which I'm happy about. But if you give it a thumbs down, you may certainly tell me why in the comments because I can't get any better if I don't know what I'm doing wrong and I do like to get better uh, if I disagree with you well then that's fine you know we all have our own opinions but if you if you get a point that I think is valid then it's something I'll take under advisement and try to make things better so there you go anyway uh, go ahead and drop into our patreon page subscribe to us subscribe to the channel Go see MikeBellevue.com for more great black powder content, and I will see you next week.